for that all goes. All right. And so last last key concepts um, for the test, and I recognize it's bringing, you know, covering new material on Tuesday and then having the midterm on Thursday is tricky. Um, but the other option is we cover this material now and it's not on the test, and and that just seems weird to me to not put the stuff we've talked about on the test. Um, so, but it will, I'll recognize when it comes to the grading and when it comes to how much points things are worth, that this stuff is in particular is still very new to you. So don't be too worried about that. All right, so we ended talking about thermodynamics on Thursday. Um, and a reminder, that our definition of spontaneous is based on our Gibbs free energy, right? So it's, and we, so we've got delta G equals delta H minus temperature in Kelvin times delta S. So we know, if we know delta H and delta S and the temperature, we should be able to predict whether or not this is a spontaneous reaction. Um, for starters, though, consider what the reaction is. It's conversion of diamonds to graphite. So keep that in mind. We plug in, what's the other thing we have to watch out for with delta H and delta S? The signs, yeah, that's one way to look at it. So we have, we actually don't even need to do the math here, do we? And the units. That was what I was actually going for. <laughs> Watch out for your delta H is kilojoules per mole, usually. And delta S is joules per mole. I got in here late. I forgot to congratulate you. I heard you had a great race last week. Thank you. Yeah. Great job. Um, you won You won conference. Nice. Yeah, it, was, it was a big surprise. Yeah. yeah. Good list. There's like one hill, and everyone kind of was like slowing down on the hill. It was really fine. Just flew ahead and then flew in, 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 the in the front. It's very cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anybody pass you? Is that you? Say? <laughs> <laughs> well, good job. Um, but you're absolutely right. The, the signs are actually going to tell us everything we need to know, right? Because delta H of the reaction is negative. So it's exothermic, meaning it's favors being spontaneous. And then delta S is a positive, not by very much, but by a little bit, which means at any temperature, delta G is going to be negative, right? Well, that's so. Is it spontaneous at room temperature? Spontaneous at every temperature, which is kind of odd to think about. Think of diamonds as being like these super tough, really, really durable objects. Um, but energetically, it's favored for them to spontaneously degrade into graphite at atmospheric pressure. The other thing that we're not considering here is that this is all assuming at a constant pressure, at a constant atmospheric pressure. Or they may have worked it into special conditions. Right. What the pressure? Yeah, right. So delta H by definition is at a constant pressure which works for most things, right? Because usually we're not going around changing our atmospheric pressure to suit our needs in any given day. Um, but you can get it to change a little bit. You have to use a different energy term that I'm blanking on what the name of it is, but there's a different, there's an equivalent of Delta H that's at for um, isothermal processes. If you keep it all at the same temperature, but you allow the pressure to change, you get a different energy term rather than Delta H. Um, but I don't know what the symbol is or what it's called, so I'd have to check my thermal book um, to remember that. But I mean, in, in even atmospheric pressure is not changing, is not going to change things that much because atmospheric pressure doesn't vary by that much on Earth. Even up here, at atmospheric pressure is not that big of a deal. But remember, when we can get to, we can get to some really, really weird phase change things that happen at really high pressures, right? Um, like different. Crystal structures for ice 
happen at super high pressures and things like that. And that's basically what happens with graphite and diamonds at a high enough pressure, you get it to actually be spontaneous to form diamonds. But at low pressures, meaning anything up to like probably close to 100 atmospheres of pressure, it's going to be spontaneous for it to form graphite. Which is why we have a mixture of both of those in our in the Earth's crust, right? Some conditions you get in a high enough pressure, high enough temperature to favor it being making a diamond. And the fact that this delta S is so small means that you can get it to switch back and forth a little bit by changing temperature. And this isn't exactly that much big of a delta H either, right? We see delta H's all the time that are in hundreds of kilojoules per mole. That think back to when we talked about uh, rotating, just rotating um, uh, ethene, right? With those Newman projections, a methyl pushing past the hydrogen is like four kilojoules per mole. So these are really, really close to delta G being equal to zero. So small changes can push it one way or the other. Um, so how come we don't see diamonds spontaneously turning back into graphite at room temperature and atmospheric pressure? Because of like the activation. Exactly. It turns out that the rate of the reaction is so slow that if you started with a diamond at the birth of the universe, it still would not have a measurable amount of graphite. So sometimes these, these rates can be so astronomically slow, astronomically in the, in the literal sense, like we're talking at that level of a scale. They can be that slow that we can effectively say they don't happen. Some reactions will never reach equilibrium within the, the lifespan of the universe. Um, so that's a pretty good indicator to say, yes, it's an equilibrium reaction technically, but it literally will never reach equilibrium no matter what we do. I guess I shouldn't say that. We can always change the conditions to help it get to equilibrium. But it turns out rates wind up being um, a very, very important factor here, right? So this is um, just a reminder, the rate of a reaction is dependent on the rate constant and the concentrations of the reactants for most things. All right, so does this look familiar from Gen Chem? We talked about rates a little bit, right? Sometimes the rate of the reaction is dependent on something happening at the molecular level. Two molecules need to bump into each other at the right speed or facing the right direction. If you don't have those two molecules in the right conditions, that's going to slow your rate down. And so they call what they say is if it's dependent on the collision of two molecules, it has a, a more complex rate law, which just means our, our simplest rates depend just on the concentration of one reactant usually. Sometimes you can have rates that don't depend on concentration at all. You can have a zero order reaction where adding more of something doesn't change the rate. When you get into biochemistry, we'll see we can actually switch from first order to zero order, depending on what the concentration is. Um, so for instance, the way your body breaks down most medications is a first order process, unless you get to such a high concentration of that medication, that you've saturated all the possible enzymes. When you've filled up all the possible enzymes with this, with this molecule, all of a sudden, it doesn't matter how much molecule there is, the enzymes are working as fast as they can already, right? It's already maxed out. It doesn't matter what the demand is. And so in that case, you have to actually have a reaction go from first order under normal conditions to zero order once it gets to that saturated condition. Um, if it, we're not going to be dealing with enzyme kinetics, enzyme kinetics are kind of their own thing because there's actually a mathematical way to represent 
when you make that sort of switch over, it turns in, it's not like flipping a switch, right? So enzyme kinetics are weird because it depends both on the concentration of the substrate and the concentration of the enzyme. Um, all factors into what is the, the overall, overall rate going to be? What are those rates relative to each other? Rather than just what we would consider a simple second order reaction, which just says, well, it depends on how much A you have and how much B you have. Nothing about how what the rates are relative to each other. Um, so if X is zero and Y is one, what order react rate is that? Does anybody remember these terms? It's kind of it's first order. It'd be first order. The over it'd be first order in B, and it'd be zero order in A. So ch adding more A doesn't change the rate. Adding more B does. Um, and overall, we'd say that's a first order reaction. And if it's if X is one and Y is one. Is one of the most common reactants or one of the most common rates um, because you wind up with it being overall second order, but it's first order in each of your reactants. So overall be second order. Yeah. Um, because you could, you could change either of them. If you double both of them, the overall rate would go up by a factor of four, which makes it second order. Um, and that's kind of the, the most common rate law, because typically the, your slowest step is literally going to be A has to run into B. If you increase amounts of both of them, the odds that you have A run into B go up, right? Um, it uses the word collision a lot, so I, I tend to use traffic as good analogies here. Um, but let's say that the reaction... The reaction we're studying is locals running into tourists on in uh, around town. If you increase the number of tourists, you increase the rate that that happens, right? If you increase the number of locals, you also increase that rate, right? If you increase both of them, then your rate goes up by both of those concentrations, right? And so it winds up being an overall second order reaction. And that's not a bad way of thinking about it, really. You just have, if you have two specific molecules that you're relying on to run into each other, increasing either of those amounts is going to speed it up. All right, so here's just a review of first order. First order means we have one reactant and it's to the first power. So if you double your amount of A, the rate doubles. Um, this is stuff like nuclear decay is a first order process. Um, anything where you use the term half-life, where it has a constant half-life, is going to be a first order reaction. So it doesn't really matter how much you have to start with, it's going to take the same amount of time to get to half, half of it. Um, so again, most, most medications are going to be first order, the way that they're, they're eliminated in the body. You guys remember doing the um, method of initial rates to figure out rate loss? Like you look at, you mix two things together with known concentrations and you look at and you measure the rate, usually for a temperature or a color change or something. How long does it take to get a color change? Then you double the concentration of one of your reactants and you measure the time. And if the time stays the same, then it must have zero as an exponent on that reactant. Is that ringing any bells? If you, if you double the concentration and the rate doubles, it must be first order. If you double the concentration and the rate quadruples, then it must be second order. And, and so in the overall reaction, um, order is just the sum of all of the coefficients. And I think we actually are going to do a method of initial rates. If I'm remembering correctly, but I might be mixing up with one of the three. Um, we definitely are going to look at kinetics a little bit. So kinetics is the, the whole field of studying chemical rates, reaction rates is referred to as kinetics. Um, and all of the 
all of the study of equilibrium and spontaneity is called thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is referring to the overall changes in energy and kinetics is referring to how you get there and what's kind of how fast you get there. All right, so this should look a little bit familiar because I've been hinting at some of these concepts for a while, right? We've even talked about them a little bit, the Boltzmann distribution. Um, ran into Bruce at the Nevada Day Parade on Saturday. I say ran into him. We knew he was coming. He always goes with the, um, he uh, walks in the parade with the Railroad Museum. You guys didn't know this about Bruce. On his spare time, he goes and he maintains the old locomotives down in Carson City. Um, and so he always walk, does that walk with them. And my kids always, when they see the train, they run out and go find him and they give him a beer. Um, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a tradition at this point where it's like four years running. Um, so when we were talking, it's like, I hate statistics. You can make statistics say anything you want. So I agree. The only kind of statistics I want is Boltzmann distribution. We just talked about that. Here's our Boltzmann distribution again. He agreed with me. He said, that's an okay kind of statistics. Um, and just so just a reminder, these two graphs look kind of similar, but here we're talking about potential energy. So this is a potential energy surface, just looking at reactants, products, and the activation energy in between. And that activation energy factors into the rate constant because the number of molecules that have enough energy to get over that barrier it's going to be dependent on the temperature and the Boltzmann distribution. All right, so I'm not going to ever have you, I guess I shouldn't say ever, I'm not going to have you um, plot this or anything like this. Just conceptually, we want to understand what's happening, why we have this, this rate, why is it that when we have above a certain amount, why doesn't the entire thing happen at once? It's because even no matter what you do to the temperature, you can speed up reaction by getting a bigger chunk of the molecules, bigger fraction of the molecules above that activation energy. Remember, by increasing the temperature, we're going to flatten this shape out, which is going to get you more and more of the molecules above that activation energy. Um, but it's never going to be 100%. And we actually... Oddly enough, this is something that was hotly contested by, by the uh, various professors in my grad school. Some of them didn't agree teaching it this way. But there are specific cases where you can get a reaction to slow down by increasing the temperature. Because you're not really slowing down, you're, you're making it so that the all of the molecules have enough energy to get to the reverse reaction immediately as well. When you get to a certain point, you're going to have almost equal amounts of molecules being able to go forward and backwards, right? Which means you're changing the equilibrium constants and you can actually make it so um, all of your products that you make immediately could go backwards as well if you have enough energy in there. So there comes a point um, where changing the temperature isn't going to help us anymore. But this reaction right here that looks just like the K equation, the equilibrium constant equation, um, I suppose I should specify since chemists like to use K all over the place, rate constants, equilibrium constants, and Boltzmann constants. Um, it's the same form of the equation. It just has this extra A term in the front of it. That capital A term, they call it the pre-exponential factor. Basically, that's what takes into account that you could have molecules run into each other, but not be oriented the right way. You need them to run into each other with enough energy and also have the geometry be right that the reactive parts, the functional groups that you want to react are actually going to be facing each other when they hit. So in, in our traffic analogy, that would be like, okay, we're not just looking at car accidents involving locals and tourists. We're looking at car accidents between locals and tourists that are also um, a head-on collision. We're going to exclude everything that's a that's a fender bender, that's a rear ending. 
that's going to change things, right? The number of locals and the number of tourists is still going to affect things the same way, but adding that geometry factor is going to change things a little bit. And that's what this A term does. There we go. We have a better drawing version. All right, so factors affecting the rate constant. Energy of activation. That's definitely going to affect the rate, affect the rate constants in an exponential way, right? Um, when I was doing computational chemistry and we were talking, we would talk about okay, um, how does how does this change affect affect the rate? The rule of thumb was at room temperature and in increasing the activation energy by five kilojoules per mole um, was a factor of ten slower because it's an exponential relationship, right? And increasing it, that means increasing it by another five kilojoules would be another factor of 10 slower. So you go up, up in 10 kilojoules per mole, it's 100 times slower. 15 kilojoules per mole was 1,000 times slower, right? Because it has that exponential relationship. So activation energy is a really big deal. Temperature also is a really big deal, although it's a little bit harder to see how that factors into it because it's got this, E to the negative one over temperature relationship. And so you have to walk that back. Like, okay, so increasing the temperature is going to make this term smaller, which makes E a E to the less negative power. Like you see how it's like, it's not even just a simple exponential relationship. It gets really weird um, when you have to work it through all of those things simultaneously. So it's not a simple. Um, relationship. Activation energy is pretty simple, pretty straightforward um, because it's just a straight ahead exponential relationship. Sorry, what was A again? Okay. That pre, the, they call this the pre exponential factor, or it's A for um, Arrhenius, the same guy who defined oh. acids and bases. Gotcha. The Arrhenius factor is the one that factors in the geometry. Not only do you, does it depend on molecules having enough energy, they also need to hit each other with the right side spacing yes. in order to react. And, and so that's going to be a constant usually. For a specific reaction, A is not really going to change with temperature or anything else. Um, it does, turns out calculation-wise, it does change a little bit based on entropy and things like that. Um, but for the most part, for a given reaction, we're going to say A is a constant. Um, and every reaction is going to have its own A value, usually. The only reason that we don't see A in the equilibrium constant um, is because if you have a forward reaction and a backward reaction, so equilibrium constants, the other way of writing equilibrium constants is it's K for the forward reaction divided by K for the backwards reaction, right? Because it depends on how fast things go forward and backward, right? Um, if both of these have close to the same A value, then we can just say that the A's are gonna cancel out. That's why we didn't see that term when it came to equilibrium. And when, which also kind of makes sense because equi at equilibrium, we're assuming, okay, everything's had enough time to get where it's going, right? If everything's had enough time to get where it's going, we don't really need to worry about the geometry because the geometry might slow things down, but given enough time, it washes out. The CDC are uh, they're doing a costume parade with all the little kids. And clearly not everybody's thrilled about their costumes. <laughs> <laughs> little kids are funny that way. My wife told me to put our youngest into a penguin costume that is like four inches too small. Four inches too small on, on a body that's only 20 inches long is a lot. And so it's like, it's just like wobbling around with it. <laughs> anyway, little kids in costumes, that's fun. Um, the other way we can affect the rate constant is if by changing the activation energy. If we can do something to change the activation energy, we can't change the Boltzmann distribution. 
I mean, other than changing the temperature. But even that will only get us so far, especially if there are other reactions that might happen. We can't just keep the bejesus out of everything and just say, well, it's going to speed things up, right? Because it also means you've got, you're increasing the probability that it's going to oxidize, that it's going to burn, that it's going to evaporate off. So sometimes we need to lower the activation energy rather than just um, increasing the temperature if we want to speed things up. Plus, the other thing about changing the temperature, that changes your equilibrium constant as well, right? So if you if you increase the temperature, you can make your reaction non-spontaneous, right? All of a sudden, by increasing temperature to increase the rate, you actually made it so it favors the reactants instead of the products all of a sudden. And that messes with your, your yield, right? So a lot of times we don't want to touch the temperature or we want, we want to drop the temperature even, but we still want the reaction to happen in a reasonable rate. And so that's where catalysis comes in. Catalysis is the, I don't know if I would call it, and it kind of is an art um, to try and design a catalytic process that gets you where you want to go without producing too many byproducts. Um, because basically it's finding a new pass. In our, our potential energy surface, we usually have them drawn as being two-dimensional, right? But really they are, they are n minus, let's see, they're three n minus three dimensional surfaces where n is the number of atoms because every single atom can be moved in relation to every single other atom, right? So it's not even a simple three dimensional surface, it's a 27 dimensional surface. And so trying to like find a new pathway to get from point A to point B with a lower activation energy can, be very, you have to be very, very creative sometimes to be able to see, okay, well, what if we tweak this over here? What's that going to do to this part of the molecule here? Is that going to lower my activation energy? Um, and it's a huge field of research. Um, you know, designing the catalytic converter was a giant win for science and, and humanity in general. Um, and it was basically how do we figure out how to complete the combustion process for all these nasty byproducts um, and then get them to stay in one place. So designing catalysts is, is a really big deal. Um, and basically what they're doing is, is, yeah, they're just, they're pathfinding through, through the mountains, trying to find that lower pass to get through. Um, Catalysis doesn't change the equilibrium constant, though, right? Because delta G was a state function. Does everybody remember what the state function meant? So we used altitude as the example. The overall net change in altitude didn't matter which pass you went through, right? Delta G for the reaction depends on where you start and where you end, not how you get there. So catalysts don't affect equilibrium constants. And the last part is sterics in that frequency factor. The frequency factor is the, another term for the, um, the pre-Arrhenius or the Arrhenius factor. How often do things hit each other? And sterics affects that too, right? Because if you happen to have a certain functional group that you're trying to get to react, but it's surrounded by like all these methyl groups that are preventing the other molecule from getting in there, that's going to slow things down, right? Um, if we if we go back to our tourists running into locals, if you surround every every local with you know pillows or something, I'm trying to think it would be um, then that's gonna that's gonna lessen the probability that that a collision happens, right? Not really. The analogy doesn't really work that far. I can't think of what a good thing to surround the, the local with would be that actually makes it make sense. Six um, foot poles. Six foot poles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every local's car was escorted by by uh, lime scooters. <laughs> um, but so yeah, so, so the lime scooters are our methyls. 
basically, if you keep things in the way, you're going to slow down the reaction you're actually trying to measure, right? So sterics do factor into that frequency factor. All right, so here's one of the trickiest things about rates versus thermodynamics. Is, is that you can have a reaction, two separate reactions that are competing reactions. This happens all the time. We call them byproducts, but really what's happening is you have two reactions happening simultaneously. If we want to try and emphasize one reaction and minimize another reaction, we can change the conditions a little bit. Um, there are some cases where a, a certain reaction is favored both by rates and by equilibrium. So on the left-hand side, the reaction that makes C and D has a lower activation energy, which means it's favored kinetic by kinetics, it's favored by rates, and it's more downhill in energy, which means it's favored by equilibrium as well, right? So if this is the case, this is what kind of what we want. If we have to have two competing reactions, a lot of times we want one of them to be favored really, really obviously. So that no matter what we do to change the conditions, we're still going to make more of C and D than E and F. E and F would be our byproducts in that case. Um, but what about if we want E and F? then we're gonna to have to change the conditions somehow to get that, right? To change this potential energy surface so that we could make more of it. Sometimes it's what you see in pharmaceuticals. One of the reasons that pharmaceuticals can be so expensive um, is that sometimes rather than try and get creative with catalysis or find a new way to make E and F, if that's our product, our pharmaceutical product, just raise the prices on these and just say, okay, well, we're just going to be happy with the 5% yield. Um, and the rest of it winds up just being waste. But if we charge enough for that 5%, that doesn't matter from a capitalism standpoint, right? But, you know, you charge what the market will bear. Um, and so pharmaceutical companies don't really have that much of a vested interest as long as they still have the patent on that chemical, because it doesn't matter. As soon as it becomes able to have a generic, which I believe for pharmaceuticals, it's like seven years um, that, that they get their patents before, before other companies can start trying to make their own version. Um, now, all of a sudden, it matters because now you can actually have competition for prices, right? But this is what's more interesting from a math standpoint, from a chemistry standpoint, because in this case, E and F is favored by rates, but C and D is favored by equilibrium. So changing the reaction temperature is actually gonna change dramatically whether we make E and F or if we can make C and D. It's almost, it's not like flipping a light switch, but we can get it to favor one versus the other pretty dramatically. Would we expect to make more E and F at a high temperature or a low temperature? And why? Less energy activation to get over the hump. Yeah, so if we can keep it so that, you know, maybe we maybe it's a slow reaction, but maybe if we keep it so that 10% of the molecules have enough energy to get to E and F, that means, you know, less than 1% of the molecules are gonna have enough energy to get way up here, right? So by keeping it at a low temperature, we can basically say almost none of it is gonna make C and D, even though C and D is favored at equilibrium. This is our carbon versus graphite difference, right? Graphite is favored at equilibrium, but the rate is such that it will never actually make that. If we go to a higher temperature, we go to a high enough temperature, everything has enough energy to go back and forth as many times. You can get A, and a plus B goes to, to C plus D, A plus B goes to E plus F, and then both of them go backwards. It almost makes more sense to put this as a um, going in two different directions. We start with A and B right here. 
here's E plus F. And here's C plus D. And A plus B can go in either direction. And really what, what this would be more like is if they were perpendicular to each other. Like we picture this being 3D. Remember what I was talking about, how it's a, a many dimensional surface. If C and D would be in and out of the board and A and B would be this way. Um, but basically A and B have a choice. Choice is the wrong word, but you know what I'm going with, right? Either they could randomly go to C plus D direction or they could go to E plus F. If they have enough energy to do both, they will do both, right? Everything that can happen does happen. By keeping the temperature low, we don't allow it to go that way. We basically say, well, A and B, the, you know, 0.001% have enough energy to make it up there, but almost everything has, you know, we'll say like 40% of the molecules have enough energy to make it here, but then they're gonna come back the other way, right? And if 40% of the molecules have enough energy to make it there, they have enough, they all have enough energy practically to make it over here. And so changing that Boltzmann distribution can change which way is favored. Because if you have, if everything has enough energy, um, let's see, what's a good enough? Let's take a, think about a moving box. And in the moving box, you, in the bottom of the moving box, you put a hundred ping pong balls and a bowl that's empty. If you're trying, if you want to get all of the ping pong balls or as many of them as you can into the bowl, you want to shake the box, but not so much that the balls hop out of the box, right? If you just shake everything like crazy, including the room, when things hop, when the ping pong balls hop out of the box, some of them might actually hop back into the box if the whole room is shaking enough, right? But you're going to dramatically favor everything falls on the ground. You might, at the end of it, still have one or two ping pong balls in the box, and maybe one or two in the bowl. But those are the statistics that we have. Those are the statistics at such a small amount because all that winds up mattering is equilibrium constant e to the minus delta g over rt. When everything has enough energy, all that matters is the thermodynamics. If we can limit which pathway they can go through, we can let kinetics control things. I also, I should um, reiterate, the other reason why you don't see, um, so activation energy is mostly a delta H term. It's very similar to delta H. Equilibrium constant has delta G, which has a delta H term and also the entropy term, right? Well, the entropy term is relatively close to a constant. That's where that, the other place mathematically where you could show where that A comes from is basically, um, you, you basically have E to the minus delta H over RT here times E to the minus T delta S over RT. There's another minus in there and then the T's cancel out. If you just get delta S over R, that term is not dependent on temperature, right? Which means that it's a constant, basically. That's where the other place where that A term comes from. And that's why it has to do with frequency and geometry, it's the odds of things happening, which is a disorder term, which is an entropy term. But it winds up being combined in here. And plus, like I said, if you have forward reactions and backward reactions, most of those constants are going to wind up canceling out. Um, so we don't really wind up showing it as a pre-exponential factor for equilibrium, but it's still there. The map all still applies. We can just basically pull it out as a constant.
when I wrote it as delta e to the minus delta g, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. That's the other place that, that comes from. Um, but even when I was, so like, I'm gonna keep going back to grad school because literally this was my job for four years was making potential energy services like that. We almost always cared about delta H way more than delta S because delta S wasn't changing with temperature and delta H didn't either, but it was in with a T term in that exponential. All right, so that, and just to put a button on this for now, we will do a lab where we actually do this, where we change the temperature and favor different reactants, different products based on um, what temperature we did it. We have to figure out, is this favored by kinetics or favored by thermodynamics, depending on what happens when we change the temperature. And it's easy enough when it's drawn out here for us. And so what I will, I will always say is if you when in doubt, just draw qualitatively what might be the case. It's gonna be one of these two things, right? Either you have one reaction that's favored by kinetics and thermodynamics, or you have one reaction favored by kinetics and the other favored by thermodynamics. And if you draw this out, trying to make sense of your lab data can make a lot more sense because you can remind yourself, these are my possibilities. And the idea that low temperature favors the kinetic product is not that hard when you're looking at this. When you're just looking at test tubes take changing color and how much time it took to get there, it's a little bit harder to figure things out qualitatively. So use these potential energy surfaces as tools. Don't be intimidated by them. They don't have to be to scale. You draw them in a way that you can illustrate what's going on mentally, conceptually. So let's see, is that a good place to take? We're gonna do a couple more minutes um, of vocab and kind of wrapping up kinetics before we get into what are the different steps that reactions can actually take in OCHEM. Um, so it turns out there actually aren't that many, but they can be put together in a lot of different ways. So a transition state is tied to kinetics because the transition state is the, is the shape of the molecules when you're at your activation energy. When you're at that local maximum, mathematically, energetically, that's really easy to think about. The transition state is the molecular geometry, the shapes of the molecules where you are at that local maximum. Right. And so a lot of times we'll talk about transition states and activation energies and almost use the two terms interchangeably because they're really two sides of the same coin, right? Okay. The activation energy is the energy term that goes with this point, and the transition state is the geometry that goes with this point. So go back to our altitude analogy. Activation energy is like the, high, the difference in altitude between here and Spooner. And the transition state is what does Spooner Summit look like? What's the latitude and longitude of Spooner Summit? Right, your coordinates in three dimensions when you get to that point. And so a lot of times transition states are going to have really weird structures because usually what's going to be happening at a transition state is a bond is breaking. It's almost always at a transition state, a bond is breaking. Sometimes we simultaneously will have a bond forming. So this is going to be the one case where you can have something drawn where it looks like a carbon has five bonds. It doesn't actually have five bonds because the bond that's breaking and the bond that's forming are not full bonds yet. They're like half bonds, right? So it still adds up to four bonds total. And things don't stay here, right? Go back to the analogy of putting a marble on top of a surface like this. It's going to immediately roll one way or the other, right? Um, and so the way we represent that, that it's a transition state, 
we don't want anybody thinking we're trying to draw this with five bonds. And so you put it in the brackets. Um, and then you use this weird typographical symbol here, um, which is called double dagger. Um, because if you actually look at really old dictionaries and typographical symbols, um, it actually looks like it's almost like a tarot card symbol. It's literally two swords pointed at each other. Um, so it kind of looks like that's hard to draw on a regular basis. So we just wind up drawing it as that. But all that that really means is that's a really unstable, we're at a local maximum. That's what that's trying to indicate. Um, and the brackets are saying this whole thing is part of that transition state. Yeah, that was just super unstable. A lowercase t that you cross twice. Yeah. Um, I, I just always thought that was really entertaining. If you look at old typographical symbols, some of them like are in um, in the character map on fonts and stuff like that. Some of them are really weird. This is one of them um, that actually does get used in a very specific instance. An important distinction between the transition state and a stable molecule or a somewhat stable molecule is that transition states by definition happen at local maximums, to use the calculus term. They're happening at the top of a potential energy surface. Intermediates are, they're concave up, again, to use the calculus term, they're at a local minimum rather than a local maximum, but they're between point A and point B. Um, to use our, our altitude analogy, if you're, drive, if you're driving from Incline Village to Sacramento, you're gonna, and you start by going to Reno, you have to go up over a pass to get to Reno, and then you have to go up and over another pass to get to Sacramento, right? That makes Reno an intermediate, but the two passes are the transition states. Does that make sense? So two transition states and then one intermediate. So you can have two, tran in this particular version, we have two transition states and one intermediate. And whether it's an intermediate or, or a product is a little bit semantics. Usually what we'll say is we will start by defining here's point A, here's where we're starting and here's where we're ending. And then any, any steps you have to take to get there are considered intermediates. Even though if we stop the reaction right here, we could say that that's the product, right? It's just a little bit defined, defining the system. But what is not dependent on defining the system is Transition states have to be at maximums. And they're always going to be super unstable. And you're going to be drawing things that are, if you're trying to draw physically what a transition state looks like, it's going to look weird because it doesn't follow our normal rules for stability. In at least one dimension, it's going to be odd. Versus our intermediates might be relatively stable. Those are your carbon cation. Exactly. Right there. So what this potential energy surface is showing is that for this molecule, for this reaction, the first step is the bromine just leaves and takes its electrons with it and leaves behind a carbocation intermediate. Then a carbocation intermediate is attracted to a chloride with a negative charge. And so that chloride will come in and form a new carbon bond to make our product. As opposed to, if I go back one step, one slide, this is the same net reaction, but as one step. 
in this reaction, we had bromine attack or bromine leaving and the chlorine attacking at the same time. So you wind up with the same net result. You broke a carbon bromine bond and you made a carbon chlorine bond, but in one step. As opposed to forming the intermediate, where you have it happening in two steps. And kinetically, there's a big difference between these two because your rate determining step, your slowest step that's going to determine the reaction rate. In this one, the rate determining step, the biggest activation energy was just the bromine leaving, right? Changing the amount of chloride is not going to change how fast that first step happens, will it? But if everything's happening at once, for this mechanism, changing the amount of chlorine will change the rate because you're relying on this molecule bumps into this molecule to make it over that activation energy. Right? So this is why we covered rates in Gen Chem, but and we said, and it helps figuring out the mechanism or the mechanism determines what the rate law is, but we kind of really didn't go much more in depth than that, right? Because other than maybe talking about what a mechanism was. This is why mechanisms are dependent on the rate law or rate laws dependent on the mechanism. It's not mix, mix up cause and effect there mm -hmm. because figuring out what that slowest step is and what molecules are involved in the slowest step is gonna allow us to figure out what the kinetics look like. What was that symbol that uh... What was the name of that symbol? That Double used? dagger. Double dagger. Is that really? That's, that's what it's called. As, as far as I'm aware, that's what it's called. I'll look it up on our break real quick um, to double check that. But um, and really, I, I have a feeling it's it was involved in some other places in chemistry, but almost always to indicate a transition state, a local maximum on a potential energy surface. All right. Last two things. Or we, I guess we'll, we'll save that. We'll come back to this. Um, and what I will bring up is the practice test just to look at how, how all of this shows up on the test. I can give you a potential energy surface. And I can say, what's going to be the slowest step? All very qualitative, right? Circle the transition states. That's going to be every local maximum is a transition state. The slowest step is going to be the one with the biggest activation energy between where you start and where you end, looking at a single step at a time. Quick question. For yeah. Mr. Um, since it looks like it's going up on either side from four, like to five and from zero to one, would there be a transition state on that? End? If there was something, it, it might be a shear wall. We typically represent these as having a little bit of a cup shape because they are concave up. Probably most accurately would, would be to stop it right here. Gotcha. And right here, because and and not represent anything outside of that. Um, Excel doesn't like to do curved lines like that, though. When you tell it to do a curved line, it fights you on that. Um, so just pay pay no attention. That just means that the potential energy surface will continue going. We don't know what's past points one to four. That's the part we're we're concerned with. Though. Good question, though. Uh, my PI had a. He really, really didn't like us drawing potential energy surfaces like that for that reason, because it hints that there's something else there. He didn't even like this part to be curved because we don't actually calculate all those points. So we used to have to draw them like line here, straight line to line here, straight line to a line here, because he didn't even like, we knew that those were actually curved surfaces because it's not a straight line as far as the energy goes. But because we didn't calculate every point along that line, he didn't want us to show it. Hmm. So you got to be careful not to read too much into the potential energy surfaces. Yeah. 
qualitatively, we know that they're curved, so I'm showing them as being curved. Um, and same with the concave parts at the ends. Um, and then, so what's the largest equilibrium constant? Would it be spontaneous at this temperature? So equilibrium constants and spontaneous, that just has to do with downhill, right? Overall net change between points one and four. Um, from one to four is uphill in free energy, right? So positive delta G, which means it would not be spontaneous at this temperature. We can't say anything else except at this temperature because as you change temperatures, all of these change relative to each other. The activation energies, unless we change, you know, make a uh, catalyst, um, the activation energies won't change per se, but two can shift up and down a little bit. Three can shift up and down a little bit. One and four can shift up and down a little bit. So you can't say about anything beyond just at this temperature. You can't make any generalizations past that without having a lot more information. And then the last part about these is what we've been, what we started with is if it's exothermic and delta S is less than zero, what would a decrease in temperature do to spontaneity? Well, end the reaction rate. Okay, so just real qualitatively, don't have to do any calculations, but it might be helpful to just make up some numbers. Or the delta G. Let's look at it. So it's exothermic, so delta H favors being spontaneous. And again, this is a place where you can just make up a number, say negative, negative 1,000 for delta H. And delta S is less than zero. So make up, say, negative 100 for delta S. Just plug in numbers. Plug in at 298 Kelvin and then at 200 Kelvin and just see what that does to delta G, right? You don't have to do it qualitatively if doing it all mentally is harder. Make up data points that meet these criteria and get the numbers is a, is a reasonable way to do this, at least to check your answers. So if it's exothermic, that favors being spontaneous. Delta S is less than zero, that favors it being non-spontaneous. When temperature goes down, the non-spontaneous piece of the equation gets smaller. So temperature going down when temperature goes down, this term gets smaller, which means this term becomes more important, and this is the term that favors spontaneous, right? So it should get more spontaneous at a lower temperature. More spontaneous means what in terms of the equilibrium constant? We means we got favor a more negative delta G means a bigger equilibrium constant. We favor the react or the products even more than we already were. Right? If we were at all, right? With, all, with it being so generic here, we can't really say if it was spontaneous or not at the two temperatures, but we can say that decreasing the temperature will make it more spontaneous, which means bigger K, even if K is still less than one, it's bigger K than it was. And in general, the general rule for reaction rates is actually a lot simpler. Does exothermic and delta S matter for reaction rate? No. No matter what, no matter what the overall delta G is, whether it's positive or negative, you still have to go uphill in energy to get across that activation energy. By definition, it's a local maximum, right? So no matter what, increasing, increasing the temperature will speed up the reaction and decreasing the temperature will slow it down. 
until you hit one of those weird crossovers where I was talking about where you actually wind up with the equilibrium throwing getting involved. That's a very rare exception. Um, if we're saying we're starting with zero product, then anything you do to increase the number of molecules that can make it over is going to increase the rate. It only starts once you have some over here, then the equilibrium can get involved. So some that's where even my professors in grad school would argue about it. Like, well, if it's happening fast enough, because these are actually can happen really, really fast to where the equilibrium starts getting involved. But by definition, if you have nothing down here, increasing the temperature increases rate, period. Would that be a good enough explanation? It says explain your reasoning. So with this whole like plugging in numbers and drawing. Yeah, using explanation. examples. Yeah, using examples would be would be fine. Um, writing out delta G and say in, in favorable, unfavorable temperature changes, unfavorable term gets smaller. Um, the ways we've been describing these, the ways I've been describing these are all totally fine. Doesn't need to get any more in depth than that. I'm basically just saying, you know, can you replicate what we've been doing in our review problems? All right. Or so let's take a break here. Let's come back a quarter after. Um, and then a reminder that our lab today is just going to be time, more time to go over this stuff. Um, so after break, if you want to keep going on the practice test and do this and then save mechanism steps for during lab, we can do that or we can finish lecture for the second half and then save going over the practice test for just in lab. So think about that over the next 10 minutes. Um, go grab some Halloween candy <laughs> and uh, I'll see you back here in, in a little bit. Oh, yeah. So, so her, this is a new process for them. Um, and I have been, I haven't put anything out because it always used to just email me. Yeah, and I told her to because I gave her the page. I was like, oh, and she's like, I think she still wanted to go. Yeah, I, I think the way she has her system set up, she can't schedule anything for you until I do my part. So I've got to fill that out. That's my my bad. And so I'll do that in our break between. Um, between lecture and lab, and and then we should be able to get you scheduled. Worst case scenario, take it with me. We'll we'll make it work since this is on me for sure. Um, but we'll we'll find a place where it works for you. But we'll try and get you scheduled today. Okay. I'm going to run over to the adjunct office and see if I can get on the email and do it right now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
Either. No. <laughs> no, I think I'm going to go over Jordan's and study. There you go. Is that class going? It's going good. It's, um, it's not too bad. I think the worst part is that I find it more interesting. <laughs> so when I have time to study, I'm like, I'm just going to a lot. <laughs> So you get ahead on that, but you're super <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I'm just like, I don't know. There's like you, you were talking about with Raw, like there's so many videos online just to look at to help like the studying and stuff. So I started doing that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty I get this class. Yeah, I need to take today to just focus on this. I think I might just skip out on the lab. I know, so I wanted to not come today, but then I was like, what if that makes me fall behind? I was like, where's that go? Well, I mean, he's not recording the lab, and that's going to be the that's going to be the bulk of yeah. what's going to help today. <laughs> yeah. But um, I can go do that online. Like we're talking about, I can yeah. go watch videos and review this stuff and just make sure I know it online. Yeah. Like, Sean's a really good teacher, but I think sometimes it's like hard for me to like understand well, that's, I mean, fair enough. <laughs> so I mean certain aspects of all teachers you know yeah don't benefit their teaching style <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it to that <laughs> but yeah like when, for example, when is a he a great example? Like she cares so much that people understand, but you know, if she doesn't really understand this, she can <laughs> panic almost and then just like yeah. speed through everything and nobody understands and nobody's gonna say anything. Yeah, exactly. How are you doing? Oh. <laughs> just ready for this quarter to be over. <laughs> It's okay. How you guys doing? Same. Caught up, at least. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've caught up before. Always dropping the ball somewhere. <laughs> you doing anything fun tonight? It's today. It's today, Halloween. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> None of us. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. um, had to plead to not work tomorrow afternoon just so I could stay for this midterm. Yeah. <laughs> They're really going to give me like a guilt trip tomorrow morning. No, <laughs> Yeah. There's, I don't know. Yeah. The whole like the room constant stuff. It's like all that shit from Gem Camp is coming back slowly right now. I don't know. Like I feel like I like half assed everything in Gen Camp mm -hmm. just to like get through right. that this is like wow I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Did you take camp last year? No, I took it two years. Yeah, I see your like we had like a the guy for like two and he like everyone just did horrible like half the class dropped yeah, like real i had sean for lecture first quarter and for lab and then second quarter i had sean for lecture and then carl for lab nice and then third quarter was carl yeah we had carl. so it was like it's interesting to like fucking spuzz. She, 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 <laughs> <laughs> i'm like i'm very yeah yeah and like people would, like we go online our lectures like a Zoom lecture, you know? And someone would ask a question and tear a teacher just like tear into them. Like, you should go with that. You shouldn't even be asking that in this class, but it's like nobody wanted to ask what they had. I think I took Jenkins four years ago, maybe because I took it my senior year of high school because oh, I was okay. doing home school. So cool. I think I yeah, I took the first part of Sean like eight years ago when I did my AA. And then I was like, oh, fuck, I can't get a job. I guess I need more job <laughs> More chemistry. More chemistry. I always need more chemistry. More physics. 
for me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, because you're getting into biochem. Biochem. We got to take physics with calc and stuff too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's this year, physics with calc. Mm -hmm. So you want to work in like pharmaceuticals or whatever. Yeah. It's just interesting shit to me. I'm not really trying to work with this shit. I want to be a sailing instructor. Sailboats are cheap, like yeah. yeah. Honestly, go get a cheap sailboat. If you just have a trailer, you know, you can fucking go pick one up off the coast. Yeah, I mean that's a cheap band around town, like on the side of the road, like you know, like two thousand bucks for like a twenty four boater. Not even that. Go get them just a trailer for five hundred bucks, go down to the coast and just pick one up off the fucking coast. Yeah. Like they're all abandoned. Really? There's a, the coast is filled with like where bots, like um, what was that? Uh, in like north, north, where people fucking banded boats, and that's sort of where all the the coast oh, bushes. Oh, they yeah. just like oh, they banned them out the ocean. They yeah, banned them out the ocean. <laughs> yeah, they just because like nobody wants to pay whatever two thousand bucks to uh, to uh you know throw away a boat because you can't, like find a VIN number on them and come back at it or something. It's easy to get a VIN number. <laughs> it's easy to rip off a boat and just like uh. Get two of the same boat, switch bin numbers. Interesting, yeah. And then, you know, play with it that way. It's like cars, you know, like cars Mercedes, just... they like laser the bin into like all these parts and like weird right. parts. So it's easy to see when they've been chopped up. Yeah. yeah. Old school, like 80s, all those, you could like just get like four of them. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the meters, you know, rebuild it. <laughs> rebuild them all into one car that runs. And yeah. it's like the only good bin number that's not stolen like, or salvaged <laughs> or anything like that. Put that onto the one that works and then you're good to go to register it. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. But yeah, I want to be, a, I, I like sailing. It's been nice yeah. and easy. Just using. It's my retirement plan, dude. Like, just get a sailboat. Yeah. That'd be my weekends, dude. Just hang out. Weird though, I'm torn because I love sailing like in Tahoe and stuff, but it's like there's not many places to go. So I'm like, it'd be sick to sail in the ocean, but I'm like, ocean fucking terrifies me. Like, yeah, you know, the storms and like, yeah, I don't know, just being lost at sea and shit. Like, yeah. If I'm lost at sea on a sailboat that I've put together, I think I'll be happy enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> but I don't watch too many movies. But... <laughs> yeah. I mean, the ocean is scary for sure, but it's not as scary as people think. Like, I mean, there are streams that can suck you up and shit, but I mean, for the most part, if you're on your boat and you know, if you're following guidelines and everything, then you're good to go. There's actually that one movie was about that one, that's like the youngest like girl, she's like 17 and she was like sailing around the world and they like, her boat was like designed to be like unsinkable, you know, like no matter what. But like oh, yeah. she survived, but like the storms were crazy. <laughs> she survived. <laughs> she like under the water, like the waves were like pulling it like forty feet on her knees, and she like upside oh, down, and it would take like several minutes for the boat to ride itself, and it get pushed back under. Oh, interesting. Like, so it's like a submarine almost. <laughs> it's just like just the way it's, it's super buoyant and super you know to like come up, but like yeah, she was like like going around like the horn of Africa or something. You know, that's like some of the worst seas that I've ever had. Yeah. Yeah, see, I wouldn't want to do anything like that. Yeah. I mean, like, the worst I'd want to do is go to just Hawaii. But I feel like it was really like, oh, for it to eat, you, then you gotta like pass through some like horrible yeah. like storm area. That's where it could get bad. Yeah. So, yeah, I watched a lot of those movies because I, I don't know, it's, it's really interesting. I don't know if I could ever do like, Even just flying over the ocean. <laughs> I feel safer floating on the ocean than flying on the ocean. Maybe I've heard it. That's just me, though. <laughs> it's uh it's not representative of actually like roughing it or going actually sailing um but if you're looking for a relatively so my wife likes trash and reality tv sometimes you know, in the nice <laughs> one that we can we can agree to watch sometimes is uh there's a below deck um uh, which is a Bravo thing where they do this like super yachts it's about the staff on super yachts and how ridiculous the, the um, passengers can get. Um, but there's one that's about a sailing yacht. That's like, a, it's like a 20 foot long sailing yacht. Um, and then they actually take it sailing in the Mediterranean. It's got, you know, it's got almost a hundred meter tall mast. Um, and 
And uh, it's it's really cool to watch them. And they're like trying to maintain perfect service and having, you know, serving champagne. <laughs> so that's sliding all over the galley while he was trying to make dinner, you know, a five-star dinner. <laughs> But uh, it's that's one of those ones. If you want a trashy reality show to watch, that's actually kind of interesting from a from a real world, not real world, but um, just like wow, that's different. I wouldn't have thought of that perspective. <laughs> it's even worse from that one. It's, yeah. Um, anyway, all right. A couple more vocab terms, and then we're going to get into mechanisms. Um, unless we'd rather start going through the take home now and the last few slides in lab, but I think this kind of makes more sense. We've already got the recording going and everything. Yeah. Okay. All right, so when we have most of what we're going to be doing in OCHEM is tracking down charges. Um, because like I mentioned in here before, in this class or my other class, basically only one of the four fundamental forces matters to us when we're in OCHEM. Gravity is too weak to matter at these scales, strong force and weak force, um, only apply to stuff smaller than a nucleus. So the only force we really care about is the electromagnetic force. Electromagnetic force in orbitals explains pretty much everything about chemistry, especially OCHEM. You get some, some, some of the really, really heavy um, elements, um, you know, some of the very, very dense heavy metals. You actually do have to take into account relativity um, because it turns out that when you have something that's as heavy as, say, an, a, ure a uranium nucleus, those 1s electrons that are orbiting it are moving around, are moving fast enough that they actually are moving at relativistic speeds. So you do wind up with having to take gravity into account sometimes, but that's far and away the exceptions. And for OCHEM, we're not dealing with anything that big. Um, so with that in mind, tracking where the charges are is going to be the bulk of what happens with these mechanisms and reactions. And so the, um, the terms we're going to use to describe that are going to be based around polarity. So a polar reaction is going to be most of what we're going to be dealing with. It's going to be, um, it says that the official definition involves the participation of polar or fully ionic reactants, intermediates, or products. That's basically going to be everything we deal, deal with in this class is going to be a polar reaction. Um, and that means that being able to, to determine where your charges and partial charges are in your molecule is going to play a big role in figuring out what's happening and what product you're going to be. Almost everything is going to come down to where are the charges, where are the electrons, and where are the sterics, which is also where are the electrons, just in a different way, right? So reminder that anything that's more polar or more electronegative is going to be better at pulling electrons towards itself, right? And so we, we describe that in OCHEM as, we'll say that there's a partial charge on the part of the molecule, um, or sometimes we'll just refer to it as there's more electron density around a certain part of the molecule. You can have something that has no polar bonds but still has lots of extra electrons, especially if you have lots of pi bonds, right? If you looked at a benzene ring, there's no polar bonds there. There's no partial positive, partial negative, but you could still look at all those pi bonds, that donut shape of electrons and say there's a lot of electron density. Um, but at its most basic, if you do have polar bonds, more electronegative means more electron density there, means partial negative there, um, which, and a lot of times they, they draw, this is sort of the physics way of drawing, um, partial charges is they draw the arrow with a plus sign built into it at one end. And what that's showing is where, what part of the molecule a positive charge would be attracted to. Doesn't really make sense from a chemistry point of view because the positive charges are never moving, right? From the chemistry point of view, we're always talking about the electrons moving, not the, the positive charges moving. So we're not going to use that style very much, but I wanted to show you so you're familiar with it. That's all this arrow means is if there was a massless positive charge, where would it be attracted? Um, and we're also usually going to define things from the point of view of the carbons, because this is OCHEM. 
we're going to deal a lot with things leaving, bonds being broken, and usually the part of the molecule that's still going to be left that we're going to continue to care about is going to be the carbon side. Um, not to say that we're not going to worry about balancing reactions anymore, but a lot of times in OCHEM we'll just be like, and then it just is often floating by itself, and we don't care about it anymore because it's not carbon. Um, so we'll see that a fair bit, and most of our language is going to be centered around the carbon as our most important frame of reference. So, for instance, um, instead of just saying partial positives and partial negatives or cations or anions, in OCHEM, we're going to talk about nucleophiles and electrophiles. And a nucleophile is just, this is from the same, same root, Greek root as philosophy, um, phile means loving. So a nucleophile is a reactant or a molecule or even a part of a molecule that is attracted to a nucleus. What would be attractive about a nucleus? What would be attracted to a nucleus or what has an attractive force? Electrons are going to be attracted to a nucleus, right? Because a nucleus is positive. It's where the protons are, right? So we say we call it a nucleophile, but really we're saying it's something that's attracted to a positive charge. And since those are all in the nucleus, they kind of get used interchangeably. Um, what was the other shirt? We're going to talk about electrophiles on the next slide, and that's just the exact opposite. Um, so nucleophile is electron rich. And it can donate electrons, which again comes back to remember our definition of Lewis acids and bases was about electron donating and electron accepting instead of protons. Um, but anything that is electron rich or that would be attracted to a partial positive or a full positive charge is going to be a nucleophile. So Ethanol and ethoxide are two examples of nucleophiles. Which, which part of it is going to be the nucleophile part of the molecule? The oxygen in both cases, right? We've got ethoxide, you have a deprotonated ethanol. So you've got a full negative charge here, but the ethanol still has a partial negative. And Zeke, you started answering a question that's actually written before I called an audible. Sorry. No, 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 it's perfect. You were saying that oxide yeah. you would expect to be a stronger nucleophile, right? Because it's got a full negative charge, not just a partial negative charge. So nothing too tricky. It's just a new way of framing the same things we've been talking about. Saying it's a stronger nucleophile just means it's more attracted to a positive charge, usually. So ether would be like the bad thing, right? With the oxygen in the middle. Yeah. Um, would that be a weaker nucleophile than ethanol? Yes. Gotcha. It's still a nucleophile because there's still a partial negative there, but carbon to oxygen is a is not as strong of a of a um, polar bond as an oxygen to a hydrogen. So this is a weaker partial negative, and therefore a weaker nucleophile. The other thing about the term nucleophile is that it starts to, it takes multiple factors into consideration sometimes because something that has is a strong nucleophile needs to have a strong charge to be attracted to a positive charge, but also sterics play a role because it has to be able to get in there and give that those electrons to the partial positive, right? So even if this was just as strong of a negative charge, it's not, but even if it was, this would be a weaker nucleophile because it has more sterics that are going to slow it down from getting in there to that, to a positive charge. Um, and we, we will actually go into a lot of detail talking about the difference between a base and a nucleophile. It turns out they're really, really similar, but a nucleophile has to be able to get to a carbon versus the base just has to be able to accept the proton. Both of them, the stronger the negative charge, the better they are at doing that. But a base doesn't take into account sterics and a nucleophile has to do. But that's, that's on another level, we'll get there. 
Yeah. Um, the flip side of elect, uh, nucleophiles is electrophiles, and it's exactly what it sounds like. A nucleophile has lots of extra electrons or a negative charge, so it's attracted to a positive. An electrophile is missing electrons or has a partial positive instead of a partial negative. And so it's attracted to electrons. Yes, can you see how both of these are kind of, you can't have one without the other really, right? A nucleophile is always going to be attracted to an electrophile because positives and negatives are attracted to each other, right? So it's a little bit just depends on our frame of reference, which again is usually going to be whatever their starting molecule is. We have a starting molecule that's carbon-based, we're going to talk about a nucleophile attacks it or an electrophile attacks it. Flip side of that is if a nucleophile attacks our carbon molecule, our carbon molecule is acting as an electrophile at the same time. Mm -hmm. But we don't usually describe it that way because we're keeping our point of view centered on whatever our starting molecule was. Would we ever see that uh, electromagnetic arrow denotation? Would that ever go towards a positive charge? No, so that's that's what it is showing. By definition, it's showing where a positive charge would move. Right, towards the negative. Which is always going to be towards the negative. Um, the advantage, the only reason this is a, a useful is because it, it basically includes a partial positive and partial negative at the same time. You don't have to draw both of them. If you draw it like this, you're showing that this end is the partial positive and this end is the partial negative already. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't like it because we are always talking about electrons, not positive charges. And so it just seems backwards to, to use that when we could just be more explicitly stating what's going on where. Gotcha. But textbooks use it. Physics, it's similar notation in physics. You do that with um, magnetic fields, right? You use, it might even be the same notation, but to indicate if you have a, a dipole or if you have a magnetic field, you draw an arrow that way. And it's almost like a vector. You can you can actually use it as vectors, and break it down into an X component and a Y component. If you have a magnetic field, um, it gets used that way to, to indicate the, the force on a positive charge, not just where is a partial positive and a partial negative, it's just more specific. Sometimes you can have molecules that can be both nucleophiles and electrophiles. If this molecule was going to act as a nucleophile, what part of it would act as a nucleophile? Oxygen's got a partial negative, right? And it's not gonna be a very strong nucleophile, but in theory, that's got a lot of electron density. It doesn't have a partial negative, but it is that part of that electron density could be attractive to a positive charge, right? So we would talk about this normally as being attractive to an electrophile, but that means that we could say that this is going to act, can act as a nucleophile a little bit too. Um, if this is our starting molecule, and we're, we would not usually define it as being an electrophile or a nucleophile, we would say a nucleophile can come in and attack here. Or an electrophile can come in and attack here, right? And so that's that's sort of the frame of reference. So could carbons two, what is it, five and six be electrophiles? Yeah. Yeah. So carbon, if we call this carbon two, is that what you're when you're referring to? Just calling that carbon one and then okay. Carbon around. So carbon one is going to have a partial positive, which means it can act as an electrophile. Gotcha. Um, the pi bond is a target for an electrophile. The carbons on either side of it are kind of a little deshielded. They they don't have as much electron density covering them because all the electron density is in between them. Okay. So those carbons actually could act as a target for a nucleophile to some extent. Right, right. Going around the top, the carbon that's on the very top, though, would that be? A... It's not really going to be much of anything because it doesn't have extra electron density or pi bonds, and it also doesn't have much of a partial positive. Gotcha. 
So the carbon that has the oxygen directly attached to it is going to have a much stronger partial positive, which means it's going to be a better target for a nucleophile or can act as a better electrophile. Go ahead. All right. Last 17 minutes. I'm going to do my best to get you out of here on time day so we can all, see, all go see the, the costume parade. Supposedly, it's happening down in the uh, main group, in the main uh, comments here. Um, now that we've defined all of our terms enough, these four steps, or some combination of them, is going to are going to make up pretty much every mechanism step that we see in OCHEM. Everything that happens in OCHEM. Every time you make a new intermediate or a new product, it's going to be one or more of these four steps. Sometimes they can happen simultaneously. Sometimes they happen in discrete steps, um, but it's always gonna be these four. And I'm gonna show you examples of each of them. Um, a quick note. So we've been talking about nucleophiles. So let's start with the nucleophilic attack because this is far and away the most common one. A nucleophilic attack just means that a pair of electrons comes in and attaches to something that has a positive or a partial positive charge. Right, so if we have a carbocation that has empty p orbital, right, because so that's a carbon with only three bonds, a lone pair from something like bromide can come in and attach there. Makes sense, right? And so in this point of view, this is acting as the electrophile, but usually we'd be talking about this as our primary molecule. So we'd say a nucleophile attacks our molecule or our intermediate or whatever. Um, another case of chemists getting very specific about their arrows, a curved arrow always shows electrons moving. So you're never gonna do a curved arrow in between products and reactants. Always, these ones always have to be straight arrows, and they can be regular reaction arrows, which indicates something is irreversible um, or that it doesn't happen backwards easily, or it can be equilibrium arrows, but they have to be very specifically in between products and reactants, right? A curved arrow is always showing a pair, of, or it's always showing electron movement. So the key here is one, make it obviously curved, but two, you're never drawing an arrow from a positive charge. The positive charge is an empty space. So if empty spaces don't move, things move into empty spaces. So it's always gonna be, if, so you can draw an arrow, like if you drew the arrow from the negative charge, a negative charge is always gonna be a lone pair, right? You can't have a negative charge on a molecule. Can I say that? I think I can. You can't have a negative charge in a molecule without having a lone pair. So it's okay to draw it from a negative charge to a positive, but never backwards. Make sense? Yeah. The other thing is that this arrow that I just drew would not be acceptable because that indicates one electron moving. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be like a. That is two electrons moving which will make a bigger difference when we get in and talk about free radical mechanisms where you do have a single electron moving. For now, everything's pairs of electrons. So we're just showing, um, doing the double, they call it double hook arrows, not a single hook arrow. Right. <laughs> All right, so nucleophilic attack is usually gonna look just like that. It's one curved arrow. drawn from a pair of electrons to something that's either a positive charge or a partial positive charge. Easy enough, right? Occasionally, this means that you have, it'll require two arrows because sometimes you have to make room for the new lone pair to come in. If you don't have a positive charge, you have a partial positive charge, that nucleophile can't come in and make a new bond until you break one of the existing bonds. So sometimes that'll be a leaving group leaving. Sometimes a pi bond breaks or a different resonance structure happens. 
But all you're showing with these arrows, every arrow is a pair of electrons moving. So you show one pair of electrons moving up to the oxygen, which makes room for another pair of electrons to come in as a nucleophile attack. Right, and then the product, when you draw these, the product's always going to be, okay, we made a new bond. That's what this arrow is showing. These arrows are always showing either a bond forming or a bond breaking. So you just look at what you drew and then draw your product according to, okay, I made a new bond. Here, I made a new bond between this carbon and this oxygen, and I broke a bond between this carbon and that oxygen. So my product looks like oxygen with a single bond, so negative charge. And then we made a new bond between our nucleophile oxygen and our target carbon. Right, so it's just a matter of adding up what you drew. Right, it takes a little bit of practice to see it, but it, it is that, that simple. It'll just seem really tricky at first. Is the net charge the same always, like you said? Yes. Um, the net charge, if, it's a, if we showed everything properly, then we have to have the same charge on both sides. Right, because we, otherwise we created an electron out of nowhere, or we lost an electron somewhere. Sometimes it can be something um, that we then are not going to worry about anymore. Like if we have uh, that chloride leaving or that bromide leaving from two slides ago, a few slides ago. If you draw everything out, the total charge has to add up. But a lot of times, what we'll see is once this bromine leaves, we don't care about it anymore. And so we'll stop drawing it, but it should still be there yet. Which brings me to the next step, leaving group leaves. Leaving groups leaving is going to look a lot like this step here, except if it's a single bond and you move a pair of electrons, there's no bond holding it together anymore, right? So leaving group leaving is literally you draw an arrow from a bond and you draw the arrow towards whatever of the two atoms is more electronegative. When a sigma bond breaks, it doesn't break homolytically, right? We talked about that. Homolytically, it doesn't split evenly and leave free radicals behind. The way it splits is the electrons go with whichever atom is more electronegative. And you're left with a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other side, usually. And occasionally, those first two steps can happen at the same time. You can have a nucleophile attack and a leaving group leave at the same time. That was this one. This transition state, your bromine is your leaving group. And your chlorine is your nucleophile. If we're going to draw the mechanism for this single step reaction, it would look like a lot of times we'll wind up showing the, um, the complete structure on the what's called the active carbon, just for the sake of um, showing you know, the geometries a little bit. So your leaving group leaves at the same time as your chloride lone pair is attacking. <clears throat> so two arrows happening at the same time, but it's just those first two steps. Nucleophile attacks is the chlorine coming in, leaving group leaves to make room for it. Right, you can't have the nucleophile attack in sp3 carbon without something leaving, right? It can be attractive to a nucleophile, but you can't make a new bond until you make room. No carbons with five bonds, right? It's the number one rule of OCHEM. All right. Number three is one we've seen before, um, is proton transfers. Usually, it's, it's a Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reaction. We call it a proton transfer, but all it really is is got something with an extra H+, plus, and you've got something with a lone pair that can act as a base. And sometimes you 
wind up making something that looks a little bit weird. In, in this instance, the long, and again, the arrows are up from the lone pair to the hydrogen. And then usually that also means you have to show the oxygen or the um, bond between the hydrogen and whatever the acid is breaking. So in other words, the hydrogen is acting as leaving group relative to the hydronium here. The lone pair here is acting as a nucleophile to pull that hydrogen off. But you show both any bonds that are breaking or forming, you need to show an arrow for that when we're doing these mechanisms. So if there was a bond and now there isn't, we need an arrow to show that that bond is breaking and where the electrons went. But conceptually, that's not tricky, right? It's just a different way of showing, maybe not even that different. This is usually the way that Carl and I show Bronson and Lauer react reactions. We just didn't define it as, this is a mechanism arrow. We just showed, hey, lone pairs are attracted to a positive. The last one is one of the trickier ones. It's more, it's not as common, for, first of all, which is helpful. It's a little trickier to wrap your head around. But sometimes you can make an intermediate, especially when it comes to carbocations, you can make an intermediate that's not very stable. So for instance, if this carbon here, has another carbon next to it. We talked about the hyperconjugation, right? About having more substitutions around uh, the uh, um, carbocation partially stabilizes it because it kind of donates some electron density into that empty p orbital. If that's the case, though, sometimes what you actually see happen is that hydrogen actually gets pulled over to the other carbon. If it can make a carbocation that's more stable in the process. So, not showing the orbitals, but let's say we had a secondary carbocation right next to a tertiary carbon. That carbon hydrogen bond can donate some electron density over here to make it more stable. But in doing so, you can actually wind up with that whole bond, that pair of electrons gets pulled over. And the reason that happens is because now we made a tertiary carbocation instead of a secondary carbocation. So if we if you have a carbon that's adjacent to a positive charge, where moving a hydrogen will make it more stable, it will rearrange itself. If I go back to this this slide. Those don't look like they're that different of orbitals, right? This is an sp3 carbon on hydrogen bond, and this is an empty p orbital. Well, if you start donating some electron density in there and it starts looking kind of like a pi bond, then all of a sudden that hydrogen is not being held very tightly in one spot. It can just sort of slide over. It still will still have the bonds back and forth, kind of donating some electron density, but that puts the positive charge on the more substituted carbon in some cases. And the more substituted carbons having a positive charge are more stable. So if you have a positive charge on a carbon, on a secondary carbon next to a tertiary, you'll move a hydrogen over. If you have a positive charge on a primary carbon next to a secondary, you'll move a hydrogen over in the rearrangement step like that. There are other types of rearrangements, but we're not going to get into them right now, but basically they all come down to, hey, this molecule is kind of unstable, and if I just sort of shuffle electrons a little bit, I can make it more stable. Right? And so this is the simplest form of that, is just pull the electrons over because you have a carbocation that's not stable. All right, so four mechanism patterns. All of the mechanism steps that you're gonna see are gonna be some variation of those, right? And, and again, I say this a lot and hopefully it doesn't come off as wrong or condescending. I don't think any of them individually are that tricky, right? It's knowing when to apply them or like 
I have all these options now. What, what do I do? I, you, know, you get decision paralysis a little bit. A lot of times in Oakham, the best thing you can do is just start drawing something and see if it makes sense. Okay, I know it's one of these four mechanism patterns. What if I tried a nucleophile attack? What does that do? And that sometimes just trying it, getting something on the paper is helpful um, to, to get your mind going. Uh, the way that this is gonna be on the midterm, we'll get more in depth with this where I do things like you guys are gonna draw your own mechanisms um, on tests. But for this test, when you're just learning it, I'm gonna give you a mechanism. And you're just gonna label each of the steps in the mechanism as being one of those four. So it's basically multiple choice, but I'm not telling you what the choices are. You have to remember nucleophile attack, leaving group leaves, uh, rearrangement, or proton transfer. And, and so some of them are easier to recognize than others, but anytime you have, oh, a lone pair is being attracted to a positive or a partial positive nucleophile attack. Oh, here we have, we're going to, looks like we're going to make a new pi bond and the chlorine is taking its electrons and going home. That's a leaving group leaves, right? And then we have some, now we have this weird structure with a positive charge on the oxygen. Here was, here's what I mean by sometimes um, the charges won't always add up. Now that we don't care about the chlorine, chlorine now that's left, or the chloride, we'll just say, and we lost the chloride, minus chloride. And then we won't draw it again because we don't care. It's there, but we don't care about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> minus chloride. Um, and then here we have, you know, lone pair attacking a hydrogen instead of attacking a carbon. If it was a lone pair attacking a carbon, it's a nucleophile attack. If it's a, nu if it's a lone pair attacking a hydrogen, it's usually going to be a proton transfer. Okay, so again, take a look, takes a little practice, get yourself really familiar with those four options at, and get their names down at least and use process of elimination, right? Okay, I know there's no hydrogen moving, therefore I know it's not proton transfer. Um, it's definitely not rearrangement because we're not moving any hydrogens from one place to another, Right, and so the more you can use that process of elimination, the more helpful it's going to be. I guess, and then this one in 10, it does have you drawing the arrows, but it shows you what the products are every step of the way. So what do you have to do to get from here to here? If you know what the product is of every step, you know what every intermediate is, and you know what your four options are, it's not too tricky to draw the arrows, right? Any bond that's broken has to have an arrow. Any bond that's formed has to have an arrow. Does that seem reasonable, despite having a short turnaround on this one? Doable. Doable. In general, as, as off balance as you might feel with this new material, um, the averages on nine and 10 on this are not typically any lower than they are on the rest of the test. So it seems intimidating because you have to do it quickly, but it's not, not that bad. Seems like we have to do it all quickly, so. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. The bottom material we'll cover in this class, huh? Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop the recording.